Now let us ask the Lord's help before the preaching of His word. O Lord our God, we praise and worship You, for You are a thinking and speaking God. And You have made us in such a way that we are thinking and speaking beings. We are thankful for the gift of a thinking mind that we instinctively think. We cannot but think, oh, this is part of our image, of your image that we bear to reflect your glory. So Lord, give us thoughts to think your thoughts after you, to delight in your word, for the opening of your word gives light. Oh Lord, feed us with your truth, that we may feel the joy and the satisfaction in hearing your word, in hearing you speaking to us through the preaching of your word. So Lord, speak, for your children are going to hear. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, tonight we are continuing our studies in 2 Timothy. Uh, we are drawing to a close, but not, to not, not tonight, uh, perhaps for one or two more weeks, we, we shall see. But we shall begin tonight at chapter 4, verse 9. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved his present well and has departed for Thessalonica. Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus, bring the cloak that I left with Carbus that chose when you come. And the books especially the parchment. My dear friends, I wonder how you feel when you read uh, these words of Paul tonight. You remember last week we consider uh, that grand valedictory of the Apostle Paul. Uh, in verse 7, I fought a good fight. I finished the race, I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And we may respond by a, a loud Amen. And that will bring this letter to a mighty Close. But Paul does not end his letter in that way, in a grand way. After such a moving and grand valedictory, Paul says to Timothy, Be diligent to come to me quickly, and so on. Does it surprise you to read that? Are you sort of a little bit disappointed that Paul is going to talk about such down-to-earth practical things like when you come, Timothy, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus and Troas and, and the books. I want my books, especially the parchment. And then make sure you come before winter. Well, I hope you are not disappointed. And we may be tempted to skim through the last uh, number of verses in 2 Timothy, but I think if we just skim through these verses, we are going to miss some precious, helpful lessons. There are surprising lessons to be learned, practical lessons, down-to-earth lessons, which will help us. 
The first thing we're going to learn tonight is how to live in need of the help of others and ask for help and receive help graciously. Paul says to Timothy, come quickly. I need you. I need you to be at my side. I need my cloak. I need my books. And that is where humble request by Paul, isn't it? Paul the great apostle. Now let's consider what sort of man Paul was. He was a well-educated man from a well-to-do family and it seems by conversion to faith in Christ he might, be, might have been disinherited from his, by his family and he suddenly uh, did not his, have his previous witches and so on. And Paul was educated under the famous rabbi Gamaliel in Jerusalem. In addressing the crowd or the mob in Acts chapter 22 verse 3, Paul says to them, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the swiftness of our father's law, and was zealous to what you as you are today. Paul has a very good background. Born in a prestigious city, received a most prestigious education, and he also is a Roman citizen. We can tell that Paul has always been a zealous man, very sincere, uh, consistent, and he's a man who is enormously capable. He must have been physically robust to make all those missionary journeys, and he's also a most practical man as well. He's also a tent maker. Paul is a very resourceful man. And he's also sociable. Paul has so many friends and co-workers, men and women, and people naturally love him. He's also a well-balanced character. Passionate, tactful, wise. And from time to time, he supported himself and also his co-workers by making tents at night. These co-workers may not be able to work so hard as he did. They were not able to have such a portable skill, but Paul was a tent maker, very good at tent making, and he could be supporting himself and his co-workers like Timothy by working at night, preaching at daytime. So this is Paul. The great apostle. But now, what has he become? He's now old, worn out before time. He's in need. He's in prison. He's in chains. In a cold, damp cell. He can feel. Winter's coming, it's getting cold. He's in need. He's in need of his blanket coat. He's in need of his spiritual son Timothy to be near him. Yes, he's now in need of others' help and companionship. And what does Paul do? He is not ashamed to ask for help. He was not too proud to be dependent on others and now is asking Timothy to drop down everything in Ephesus. With the many congregations, the problems there, and Paul says, I'm sending Tychicus to Ephesus to take your place. You come. You drop down everything to come by my side before winter. And when you make that journey, make sure when you pass through Troas, 
get my clothes. I left that with covers there. I need that. And I want my books, especially the parchment. We wonder what are these books. We surmise Paul is not going to wait for amusement or entertainment. Maybe, quite likely, these will be Old Testament scrolls. Isaiah scroll, perhaps? Other books, perhaps? I need that. It's quite interesting that there is some sort of a almost like an echo when William Tyndale the 16th century the pioneer translator of the Bible into English he was betrayed captured, he was imprisoned eventually executed and he was in the same situation and he asked for his cloak he asked for his woolen shirt and above all, he says, please, I want my Hebrew Bible and the dictionary and the grammar. I want to study the Hebrew Bible. It's very touching, isn't it? But we learn here, don't be afraid when you need to ask for it and to receive it graciously. My dear friends, I want to say this to you. Uh, maybe you don't need this lesson now, but you may need this later on. It takes much grace to ask for help and to receive it graciously. Yes, we know as our Lord Jesus says, it's more blessed to give than to receive. We know that. It's good to be givers. But there are times when we need to be receivers. To some people, it actually takes more grace to receive than to give. To some of us tonight, perhaps, it will be far easier to give than to receive. You are naturally strong, you are talented, you have wealth, you're generous, you want to give. But dear friends, we can be patronizing in giving. We can be too proud, too independent, too self-sufficient to be willing to be help and to be dependent on other people's charity. Does it frighten you to live in charity? There are some people who love to give away books, for example, but they don't want to receive books. I'm okay. <laughs> I don't need your recommendation. I like to read my own books. Well, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, when he entered into the ministry, he gave away his money, his saving to his mother, so that he would be dependent on people's giving to survive. As a specialist doctor, for some years he would have a sizable amount of saving, but he wants to live depending on others' giving. Isn't that something? The lesson, the first lesson we learn tonight is we are to learn how to live in need of the help of others graciously. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, Paul says to his financial supporters, his own spiritual children, he says, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Isn't that something for us to learn? 
Paul says there, I have learned. There is a learning process. It takes time, it takes a humble spirit to learn how to be rich, to have abundance, and how to be in need. We have to learn how to be able to give as well as willing to receive. I remember years ago, I listened to some talk by J.R. Packer, and he mentioned time and again, in Christian fellowship, we must not only be willing to give, but also be willing to receive. And he was talking about, especially on, uh, well, that was many years ago, uh, that the Western Christians have this patronizing spirit. All we are helping the poor in the East. We are sending missionaries to help them. They need our money. They need our teaching. In our giving, we must not have a patronizing spirit or attitude. We must not have that in us, and it must also not to be seen in us. In our giving, it takes much tactfulness and wisdom to give so as not to embarrass others. Yes, we need much wisdom to help others in a kind, gentle, thoughtful way in a non-patronizing attitude. I say, there is something to learn. And in receiving, we must not feel miserable or unhappy that we are reduced to such a state of dependence on other people's kindness and generosity. We must not be too proud to ask for help and receive it. My dear friends, I dare to say this to you, to drive home the lesson, is actually a sin. When we are in need, and we are not willing to ask for help, and when we are in need, and when we are given help, or people suggest help to us, we refuse to accept it because we are too proud to receive it. I want to be independent. But friends, the Lord may be saying to you, you are no longer to be independent. You are to be dependent, not just on me, but on other people. My friends, I want to say this to you and to myself. It is of the Lord, whether we are givers or receivers. And it takes much grace for givers to become receivers. It's not easy for self-reliant, one strong, which people to become dependent on others. But Lord of the Apostle Paul, it's just so beautiful. He is a man mature by the grace of God. He's so gracious. On the one hand, even though in prison, even though in chains, he's still the mission director for well mission. He's sending this to there, that man to another place. He's very much in control. On the other hand, he can be so humble and ask for his spiritual son, Timothy, to come to his side quickly before winter and to bring along those clothes and books and so on to him. He asked especially for Timothy. He can send Tychicus to Ephesus, but he wants Timothy to come to him. Isn't there something? I recall what William Steele liked to say. We are to be naturally spiritual and spiritually natural. In becoming Christians, we don't become unnatural. We are to be spiritually natural and naturally spiritual. Well, what a surprising lesson, isn't it? But when you think of that, I think the lesson is really here. 
Second thing we notice tonight is the tremendous gospel advances, the rapid spread of the kingdom of God in so short a time. Look at verse 10 again. Uh, Demas has gone to Thessalonica, Crescent for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, Tychicus Paul is now sending to Ephesus, and there's a Troas, which has got a Christian church, and Corinth, and Miletus. Well, Paul has plundered these churches in all these places. Uh, I think Stephen is going to show you a map, isn't he? Uh, on these places. Where, where are these places? Well, Thessalonica is in uh, northern Greece. In those days, the province of Macedonia, Galatia, uh, Turkey, southern Turkey, uh, Dalmatia, it's actually modern day Yugoslavia, Ephesus, Turkey again, uh, Troas, on that coastal city, uh, Corinth, Greece, Miletus, Miletus, back in Turkey. So if you look at that map and you notice uh, the location of these, these different cities, the gospel has spread all through Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, Greece, Yugoslavia, and it was just less than 40 years since Jesus' death and resurrection. And Paul is now a prisoner in Rome. The gospel has spread all over the Roman world in so short a time to these major centers of the Roman Empire. Isn't that amazing? Less than 40 years, Jesus was crucified as a malefactor, as a criminal, as an insurrectionist. But now the gospel has spread everywhere. Well, sociologists like to suggest reason for this. Oh, they're saying, well, maybe the people in those days were very empty. Uh, maybe they were frustrated with their traditional religions and they tried to find reason to ex explain humanly speaking uh, the expansion of the early church and they have tried to do the same to explain uh, the major revivals like the reformation or the great awakening they are going to say is this sociological factor and change of culture and people's psychology and so on. Uh, those reasons cannot explain the spread of the gospel. Whether it was in the early church, whether it was the Reformation, whether it was a great awakening in America, the only explanation for the rapid spread of the gospel in Paul's days and in subsequent revivals is because Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And he's in heaven. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And he has sent down the Holy Spirit to move people to faith in himself. Sometimes the Lord Christ is sending down the Spirit in a Work away in terms of influencing the people, bring more conversion, sometimes less. Well, certainly, I'd like to clarify, the Lord Christ sent down the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, but there will be times when the Holy Spirit is working mightier, there will be times when the Spirit is not working so uh, obviously. There is some small things like what we are living now. But there's no account that can explain the rapid spread of the gospel in the early church apart from Christ's kingship and the work of the Holy Spirit. 
And that's why, my dear friends, we need to pray. Because apart from the Holy Spirit's work, all the preaching tonight will be in vain. There will be just words only. We need to pray for the continual work of the Holy Spirit, week by week, Sabbath after Sabbath, service after service, we're going to ask the Spirit to work continually, even continuously, I should say. And we are also to work, we are also to pray for the Holy Spirit to work in remarkable way. We are to pray down the Holy Spirit in terms of asking for revival, asking for mighty advances of the Gospel. Like what happened in the 18th century, in the 1740s, and so on, in, in England, in New England. Well, if I may go uh, to spend uh, one or two minutes talking about history, uh, we've been looking at the Puritan movement, reading their books, and so on. But after the Restoration, uh, the Puritan movement has really uh, waned and there was a time of barrenness, unbelief in society, in England, uh, great need, uh, drunkenness was a big problem, and so on. And then the Lord raised up young men like Whitfield, and the Wesley brothers in New England, Edwards and others. And that was so wonderful. The work of the Holy Spirit. And we had to pray for that. To long for that. To expect the Lord to come down in answering our prayer. And tonight, we shall also, before I finish, begin to look at the people Paul mentions here. And we start with a deserter. Go back to verse 9. Paul says to Timothy, Be diligent to come to me quickly. Why? Why such an urgent need? For, in verse 10, for, because Demas have forsaken me, having loved this present well, and is gone to Thessalonica. Demas was once Paul's closest associate. Demas was with Paul in his first imprisonment in Rome, for example, Colossians 4, 14. Paul says, to the church in Colossae, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. In the same imprisonment, he wrote Philemon in verse 24, Paul says, as do Mark Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. Demas was with Paul in his first imprisonment in Rome. Demas has long been Paul's close associate. He belongs to Paul's innermost circle of fellow workers. But he deserted. Did Demas desert the Christian faith also and not just Paul? We hope not. Maybe Demas just deserted Paul for easier and less dangerous ministry in Thessalonica. Maybe the church in Thessalonica, Thessalonica uh, paid him well and he left there. But friends, the language here does not favor a soft interpretation. Look at it again. Demas 
having loved the present world. Then that is in such contrast, sharp contrast, to verse 8. Remember in verse 8, Paul says, There's lay up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Verse 8, so grand and magnificent, the crown of righteousness we serve for those who have loved Christ's appearing. Verse 10, Demas, having loved the present well. On the one hand, the love for Christ's glorious return. On the other hand, Demas has loved the present well. Two kinds of love. And also the word in verse 10, forsake. Demon, oh sorry, demons have forsaken me. That word forsake is the same Greek word in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, what we call the Septuagint. LXX in Psalm 22, the first verse. When prophecy, the Messiah cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Same word. In Greek, Demas has forsaken me. It's too depressing to contemplate. Where is Demas now? The news of Demas' desertion must have been a shock to Timothy. Timothy must have said, have I read it correctly? Who should forsake Paul? Oh no, it's Demas. Dear Demas, Demas, my dear brother, I oh, can't believe it. The news of Demas' desertion must have sent a shiver down the spine of Timothy. He must say, Oh Lord, give me grace to persevere. How can it be? Lord, keep me that I may keep close to you. Oh Lord, cause Demas to come back to you. And here we learn in a positive way that the key to perseverance in the Christian faith is love for Christ. What do we really love tonight? Whom do we hold the most precious? What is your first love? Jude, tell Christian people to keep themselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That is a command to all of us. We are to keep ourselves in the love of God. We are to keep alive that sense of God's love for us and stir up our souls and our hearts to love God more and more. We are to experience the warmth of God's love. And not just going for a treadmill, so to say, in the Christian life. That is in Jude verse 21. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14, Paul says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all die. What drive Paul on, day after day, month after month, year after year, in prison, in freedom, in abundance, in need, in cold or heat, in danger or security, is the love of Christ. Christ has loved me so much, and I love my Savior. It's the love of Christ that drives him on, as the love of Christ 
That should drive us on. Or as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 and onward, we should be rooted and grounded in love, that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. We are not just to have sound doctrines, but we are to have sound doctrines which result in increasing love for the Savior. That's why we should be reading Christian biographies regularly, not just doctrinal books, not just even commentaries, because we want to have this fellowship with the saints in days gone by, that as we see how they serve the Lord, how they persevere, how they were filled with the love of Christ, we'll be encouraged. We must have doctrines on fire. We must not just be shining as light, but burning as fire. There's a book in our library here called Wesley and the man who followed him. But Ian Murray also moved to read that book because even Wesley theology is not 100% correct. And yet, he and the people who followed him, they were on fire with the love of God. They felt the love of God deeply. They were driven on by the love of Christ. They were so zealous, so self-denying, all because they had been ignited by the fire of the love of Christ. And my dear friends, let me close with this. This is what our fellowship should be aiming at as we meet again. Our fellowship is not just socializing. We're to aim at stirring up love and good works. We have to stop here tonight. We'll stop at Demas, but next week, God be willing, we shall meet face to face and we are going to see some of the faithful people who keep on serving the Lord uh, in thick and thin, through thick and thin, in different places. And uh, we shall be looking at that. Now let's pray. Oh Lord our God, we are so thankful to you for the example of faith of your servant Paul, how he suffered, how he died in faith triumphantly. May we have a portion of his faith and faithfulness. We are also thankful to you for a, very, for a very practical lesson we learn from Paul's humility, his naturalness. He's not ashamed to ask for help and just be himself before you. Oh, what a lesson. Oh, what a lesson we should learn. May we have that humility to be willing, if needs be, to be dependent on others. May we have that humility to let others know our needs in a wise manner. Oh Lord, give us grace to be givers and receivers. May we learn to be content in whatever situation you may place us in. If you place us in abundance, if we are meant to be givers, may we give not just generously, but tactfully. 
wisely, kindly. And if you should place us to be receivers, may we receive help, thankfully, in meekness, in all gentleness and kindness. Oh Lord, we do pray for ourselves as we meet together next Lord's Day. Help us to come together valuing the opportunity to see one another face to face and that we may stir up love and good works. May we be wise and gentle to preserve and promote the bond of peace and unity in love. Oh Lord, help us to help each other to labor together. Give us grace to say words in season. Oh, that we may be wise. And we do pray for your church worldwide. Part of your church is under threat from wrong teachings. Lord, preserve the purity of the faith. Some believers are discouraged when they see the failures, the sins of their fellow Christians and maybe Christian leaders. May our eyes be fixed on Christ. Other believers are sick and weak. Lord, give them grace to cope. Grant healing according to your mercy. Oh, some of us are waiting, are waiting for needed overseas travel. Lord, help us to be patient, to be submissive. And there are believers who are in prison like Paul. Yes, winter is coming in the northern hemisphere. It's going to be a time of suffering for them. Lord, bring in the needed clothes and blankets. Yes, bring in the needed scriptures, the needed books. Oh God, we are so thankful to you that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Men and women who suffered not just now, but in days gone by. All will be called. There will be men like Paul and Tyndale and many others. Lord, may we follow their footsteps of faith and faithfulness and persevere. Help us each day to be your witnesses. As we go back to physical work, may we be your witnesses in the workplace. Lord, help us. In Jesus' name. Amen.